The Dharma is medicine. Medicine for the ailments of the mind. And just as with medicine for the body, there's some medicines that are meant to be preventive, and other medicines that are meant to deal with illnesses you've already got. And although we have the Buddha as the primary doctor, and other people are more experienced on the path as doctors who can give us advice. We're the ones who have to take the medicine. It's the same as out in the world. The doctor can give you all kinds of good advice on how to live, but you're the person who actually has to live. He can give you a medicine, but you're the one who has to take it. Occasionally a Dharma talk might be like getting a shot from the doctor in which he He's the one who actually has to give you the medicine, but for the most part, you're the one who has to do the work. Your doctor is in training. The problem, though, is compounded by the fact that one of the main diseases in the mind is delusion. And it's the nature of delusion that you don't know you're deluded. So it's a good precaution. You have to go on the assumption that okay, as long as there's suffering, as long as there's stress, you're still suffering from delusion. So there's always something new to learn. There's always the possibility that you might be misreading the diagnosis. Or applying the wrong medicine. So that's why it's important that you have someone else around who can see your, your diseases and give you advice. But even when there is someone like that around you, the person's not going to be around 24-7. You've got to learn how to watch for the symptoms. And to begin with, you've got to learn preventive medicine. A lot of what the breath is. What the breath can do for you is as preventive medicine. Because germs don't just simply come into the mind. You go out looking for them. It's like knowing that a, a countertop in the kitchen is full of germs, and you go and you lick it up. Now, do you blame the germs for being there? Well, no, but you're the one who put the tongue on the, the counter. Why did you do that? Well, you were hungry. Maybe you thought there might be a little bit of food film left over on the counter, but there are all those germs there as well. So the first thing you've got to do is feed the mind properly. A sense of well-being with the breath helps an awful lot in that way. You breathe in, breathe out. Try to develop a sense of fullness. Notice where in the body when you're breathing in and breathing out there's a sense of pulling it in. A sense that you're really hungry for the breath. Try to think of that air of the body as filling up immediately as soon as the in-breath starts, so you don't have to pull anything in. See if you have a sense of pulling around your nose or around your cheeks. You think of the breath coming in not just through the nostrils, but also from the sides of the cheeks as well, so you don't have to pull anything in. This allows you to develop a sense of fullness there. The breath is excuse me, the blood is allowed to flow in a relaxed way through those parts of the body. The blood vessels relax. Things fill up. And you develop a sense of fullness. Learn to develop that in different parts of the body. It may be hard at the beginning to develop it in the whole body all at once, but work on it section by section. Think of your hands being full all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. Lend your wrists. 
your forearms, your elbows, the upper arms, your shoulders, and then start at your feet, start at the toes, and work up the body, section by section. So there's a sense of fullness all the way through the breath cycle. When you've got that sense of fullness, it's nourishing to the body. You feel less hungry. It's nourishing to the mind. You're starting to hunger less for outside distractions. And you're building up your resistance. So when pretty sights come that might give rise to lust or greed, or disturbing ones that would provoke your anger. You find that you're not interested. You think if you went there, you'd just create more trouble for yourself. This is how you build up resistance. And also, this is how you also build up resistance to the mind's tendency to go out and look for trouble. This is how restraint of the senses and concentration practice work together. Because it's not simply the fact that outside stimuli come in and barge in on the mind. You have to create the bridge. You're, after all, you're the one who looks. You're the one who listens. There's an intentional element there, and you have to ask yourself, what is the intention? When you're looking, what are you looking for? That way, in addition to building up resistance to disease, you also learn how to protect yourself from diseased areas, sources of disease. It's like knowing there's an epidemic in a particular country, so you don't go there. It's like knowing that there's a contaminated water supply, so you don't drink the water. Now, if you're really thirsty, it's very tempting to drink the water no matter what. But if you've got a sense of well-being inside, you've got your own healthy water inside, so the body feels well watered by the breath, that's one level of protection against going out and drinking up contaminated stuff. Same way when you notice that a particular disease has arisen, you've got to learn how to separate yourself from the causes. Because if you've got a cold and you keep going into places where there are people with colds, it's just going to keep hanging on and hanging on. And it's the same with the mind. If you find that there are certain topics that when you think about them give rise to greed, anger, delusion, you've got to give yourself an alternative place to go. Again, this is how the breath helps. And then you look and see what the symptoms of the greed, anger, delusion are in the body. Because sometimes those aggravate the problem. This, this is another area where the breath can help. Here it's the breath is not so much preventive medicine as healing medicine. We've all felt the sensations in the body that go along with anger. We know they're there. Many times we're not fully aware of them. But it's good to make yourself conscious when you're angry. How does the breath feel? How do the different parts of your body feel? Can you change the breathing? The anger doesn't come from the body. But the symptoms in the body many times aggravate it. In other words, there's a brief flash of anger, and hormones get churned up in your bloodstream. And the flash of anger goes after a while, but the hormones are still there. And so you've still got the physical symptoms of anger. And you notice that, and you say, well, I must feel, still feel angry. So that sparks the anger again. This way you keep going back and contaminating yourself again and again and again. So as soon as there is that sense of bottled up pressure that comes from the anger, Learn how to breathe through it and remind yourself. This is where your internal med medical theory comes in, to remind yourself, because there will be a continued while while the hormones are still in the bloodstream, simply because there are the 
physical symptoms of anger doesn't mean that there's still a steady state of anger in the mind. It comes and goes. When you can make that distinction and then try to breathe as much as you can through the physical symptoms, it may take a while. But this helps you from recontaminating yourself. So the breath is one of the helpful medicines, both for preventive medicine to help prevent diseases as an adjunct to other preventive medicines, like restraint of the senses. And it's also kind of healing medicine. So it's anger has flared up in the mind, you at least make sure that the body doesn't aggravate the condition. Then when you're coming from a healthier physical sense inside, then you can start looking at the anger in a healthy way. In other words, bringing your mental medicine as well. Looking at the situation. Say if you see someone who's been acting in a very bad way, remind yourself, well, is there something good about that person? Because remember, you're sick. You can't go around just picking up more germs from other people, so you've got to look at the good side. Or in the Buddha's analogy, you're walking through a desert, hot, trembling, thirsty, and you come across a little cow footprint, and there's a little tiny puddle of water in the footprint. You need that water. You can't scoop it up because you'll make it muddy, so you have to get down and slurp it up very carefully. The water is that valuable to you. In the same way, other people's goodness is valuable to you. If you focus on their bad points, just aggravate your own diseases, aggravate your own thirst. Other people's good points are like water for you. You need it. So the breath helps a lot with, it's not the total medicine and the treatment, but it's one of the very helpful medicines has to be allied with a proper understanding of what actually causes the diseases in the mind. And John Lee makes the point that it's not only the case that beautiful things come in from outside and cause passion to flare up, or disagreeable things come in from outside and cause anger to flare up. Many times you're looking for something to make you passionate. You're looking for something to make you angry. You're licking the toilet seat. Trying to get yourself sick. So you've got to learn how to put a stop to that. This is why restraint of the senses is important, why right view is an important medicine as well. The breath, learning how to work properly with the breath, simply gives you the strength that you can apply the other medicines well. So you're not so hungry. You're not so foolish to go out and try to get diseased. So the breath is an important part of your medical arsenal. It's not the whole arsenal. You need a full set. After all, the Buddha said there are eight folds to this eightfold path. And working with the breath covers three of them, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. But you need the other factors of the path as well. But altogether, they are the Buddha's medicine cabinet. So as long as you know that you're subject to illnesses and that you've got some, one of these sort of underlying continual diseases, where they say some people have a a continual sort of low level level of inflammation in their bodies. The mind has that continuing level of de delusion. Got to watch out for that. But you would do your best 
to chip away at it bit by bit by bit, listening to other people, using your own appropriate attention to see where there's still stress and what's coming along with it. In combination of your own developing skill and the lessons you can learn from outside. These will help you to be a good doctor. So even though the body may still have diseases, the mind doesn't have to be diseased. That, as the Buddha pointed out, is true health. <laughs>